Good evening, everybody. I am Susan Stewart. I'm a member of the Gifford Committee and representing the Gifford Committee in inviting you this evening very warmly to the second of Professor Ramachandran's lectures on body and mind insights from neuroscience. Just wanted to get it exactly right. Um, I'm sure many of you were here on Monday evening and have heard the wonderful introduction given uh, to Professor Ramachandran by our Clerk of Senate, uh, Professor Graham Kai. So, and I know you haven't come to hear me, so I'm just going to keep it very brief. We are absolutely delighted to have Professor Ramachandran here. He's made such an impact in neuroscience, neuropsychology, in so many areas in uh, treating Capgras syndrome, phantom limb phenomena, um, pain, not just in phantom limbs, in, my goodness, um, syn work in synesthesia, his work in neurotheology, and this evening is going to be a delight for all of us. So I'm going to stop at this point and introduce you to Professor Ramachandran. The microphone is active. People at the back hear me? Thank you. Well, I'm deeply honored to be here giving the Gifford lectures and would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm going to talk about the brain, of course, which is made up of 100 billion nerve cells, tiny little wisps of protoplasm firing away. And all your mental life, your thoughts, your ideas, your feelings, your emotions, your passions, everything, even what you regard as your own intimate inner self has its origin in the activity of these nerve cells in the brain, the patterns of activity. So the pattern of activity more or less represents or symbolizes events and objects in the external world. And the question is, how do you study the functions of the brain? There are many different approaches to studying the human brain. Our approach is to look at patients who have sustained injury to a tiny little part of the brain, a lesion in a small part of the brain, caused by either by a stroke or a head injury or a tumor. And what, often what happens is there's a very profound but, high, but highly selective loss of one specific function, one specific aspect of the mind. And by studying these deficits and correlating them with the structure, you can begin to understand how the normal brain functions and how you might be able to help the patient. So that's our agenda. Now, it's difficult to confront a patient in a neurology clinic uh, as uh, Dr. Bach would tell you here, one of my colleagues, and not uh, be confronted with some of the most fundamental problems in philosophy, which is the pro problem of delusion and reality, of truth and deception, of free will and determinism, of mind and body, all of these questions that philosophers usually grapple with. You come, to face, come face to face with these problems in studying patients in the neurology clinic. Let me give you some examples of such syndrome. Well, one of my favorites, as you all know, is phantom limbs, where a patient has lost an arm uh, or a leg and continues to vividly feel the presence of that missing arm or leg. A lovely example comes from Lord Nelson, who, as many of you may know, lost an arm uh, in battle with, uh, with Napoleon, I think, and, con and continued to vividly feel the presence of that arm, a phantom limb, and used his phantom to infer the existence of a non-corporeal soul. He said, his logic was the following. He said, if an arm can survive physical annihilation, survive in spirit, why not the entire body disappear and you still survive the annihilation of the body? Somewhat sort of tenuous reasoning, but quite intriguing nonetheless. Another example, in a sense, the converse, is denial of ownership of the arm. So in, fa in phantom limb, the arm is gone, but you continue to feel the presence of the arm. But sometimes you have par right parietal lobe lesions Right parietal lobe is where you construct a representation of your body, or what you call your body image. When that's damaged in the right parietal lobe, you get paralysis of the left side of the body. But in addition, in, in rare cases, the patient will say, doctor, this arm does not belong to me. It belongs to my mother. And there are varying grades of denial, which I can talk about in a minute. And then there's, a, again, a related syndrome, but not quite related, and that's apotemnophilia, where a patient, which I discussed on Monday, where a patient does not deny the ownership of the arm, 
he, he acknowledges that the arm belongs to him, but says he, it doesn't, he doesn't want the arm. Because it feels somehow alien or feels uh, he's abhorrent. And so he wants to get the arm removed or amputated. And in fact, about half the, num half the patients go on to get the arm removed or amputated. Quite a bizarre syndrome, which Paul McGeer and I have studied. And I described this to you in detail on Monday. Uh, and then there is um, the ultimate denial, which is Cortad syndrome, that a patient doesn't deny merely the one part of the body, but denies the existence of his entire body. In fact, denies his own existence. The ultimate paradox, a person denying his own existence, called Cotard syndrome or nihilistic delusion. And uh, lastly, there is God. There are people who claim with lesions in the temporal lobes, who have seizures originating in the temporal lobes, who claim that they're, they're in direct communication with God, they achieve communion with God. And in fact, some of them will claim they are God. Well, it doesn't imply that God doesn't exist, of course, and we can take this up during the discussion. But to me, it's very intriguing. First pointed out by Norm Geshwin, but even earlier, a long time ago, around the turn of the century, noticed that people with seizures originating in the temporal lobes uh, develop these mystical experiences, profound mystical experiences. So much so that many of these patients refuse to be treated with drugs to eliminate the seizures, saying they'd rather trade, they don't, they don't mind having the seizures, but they don't want to have their mystical experiences removed. And that's perfectly understandable, I think. Now, so these are the syndromes I just mentioned. Phantom limb, somatoparaphrenia, apotemnophilia, Cotard syndrome, and experience of God and temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, now, why this happens is an interesting question, and hopefully we'll have some time towards the end of the lecture to discuss it. If not, maybe somebody will raise it during discussion. Now, when I give these lectures, people inevitably in the audience ask me whether, or at least reporters ask me, what's my own view? Do I believe in God? Of course, it's a very difficult question to answer. But I think that I thought about it a little bit. And I think there are several ways of approaching this problem. I don't, I don't want to say six logical alternatives, but they're not really logical um, categories, but the sort of rule of thumb approaches to the existence of God. One, of course, is the belief in a personal, dead, personal God who is involved in human affairs and responds to prayer, at least on occasion, right? So that's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then, of course, there is outright atheism, that God, the belief in God is like believing in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. Then there is a belief in an abstract God of Spinoza or Upanishads in, in Hindu philosophy, uh, or Kant, for that matter. And then there's agnosticism, I don't know. And that comes from Huxley. I think the term comes from Huxley, but maybe some of the theologians here can correct me on that. And then there is one less well-known view, which is called, which I like to call complementarity, which has been promoted by Freeman Dyson. That is the notion that belief in you know, the role of religion and humanities and the fine arts and poetry and theology and religion, all of that, complements, doesn't necessarily negate scientific materialism. These are two different ways of looking at reality. In the same way that light can be seen as either as waves or as particles, and these two views don't necessarily contradict each other. Each view is completely correct in its own right. Likewise, our attitude towards the world, towards religion and God, is not fundamentally uh, incompatible with scientific materialism. And exactly how you would defend that position philosophically, I don't know, but it's an idea that I find appealing. And it's very close to the way I feel about some of these issues. Then there's also ambivalence. And that is, one day you are one thing, one day you believe in God, the next day you don't. And I find myself doing this quite a bit. Right? <laughs> but when I'm lecturing to scientists or talking to scientists, I become a scientific materialist, and mysteriously, the next day I transform into a person who believes in God. And I don't think such ambivalence is, is unusual. Uh, there's also another category, seventh category, if you want, which is simultaneously believing, believing you know, simultaneously believing and not believing. And this sounds very strange, but we see it in our patients. Not, we see it in, in no, common life in all of us normal people, but we also see it in patients. For example, I told you about this disorder, somatoparaphrenia, where a patient denies paralysis, sorry, denies the ownership of his own, own arm. Uh, and sometimes, much more common is a disorder called anosognosia, where a patient, described by Babinski, the French neurologist, where a patient will deny that he's paralyzed. He's got a right parietal uh, lesion, stroke, complete paralysis of the left side of the body, cannot even move, there's no flicker of movement in his left arm, but he will deny that he was paralyzed. He'll say, my arm is doing fine, I can 
pull that, lift that table with my left arm, everything is fine. Now, the inter interesting thing about these delusions is their highly selective nature. The fact that the person is not just crazy or something, the person can play chess with you, uh, so long as you're not neglecting too much on the left side, or can discuss politics with you, can recite poetry, can do mathematics, everything seems fine, but when it comes to his left arm, he'll say it's not paralyzed, it's moving fine. Now, I, I saw a patient not long ago in India, just to illustrate the point about contradictory beliefs coexisting in, in the same person, but even though the person has a unified mind in other respects. So this woman, very intelligent lady, I saw her in the clinic about two weeks after her stroke. She, was, she had been denying that her left arm was paralyzed. So I asked, can you use your right hand? Yes. Can you use your left hand? Yes. Are they equally strong? Yes, they're equally strong, doctor. Okay. Then I raised her left arm towards her. And I said, whose arm is this? Oh, that's my mother's hand, um, doctor. And I said, why do you think it's, my, it's your mother's arm? Well, it's, it's, um, it's wrinkled and it's old. And I dropped the hand. And then I said, whose hand is this? He said, oh, it's my mother's arm. But where is your mother? I said, oh, my mother? Oh, she's hiding under the table. Now, this person, are not, this not, person isn't lying. But she sincerely believes this at some level. So she confabulates, makes it a plausible sounding story. I don't think mother hiding under the table is very plausible, but... It's the only sense she can, she can make out of it. Here comes the best part. I said, now, so this is, this is your mother's arm. Yes, it's my mother's arm. What about your arm? Can you use your arm? Yes, I can use my arm, fine. You can use your left arm? Yes, I can use my left arm. Okay, I want you to touch your nose with your left arm. What do you expect her to do? She does this. Okay, now this is fascinating because it says that at some level, she knows this is her left arm because why is she grabbing her, her left arm, her own left arm? if it's her mother's arm. Secondly, she knows it's paralyzed, because why she then, she doesn't know it's paralyzed, why she then grabbing it and using her right arm as a tool to reach and touch her nose. This shows the, exist, the coexistence of multiple layers of belief in an individual person. So I, I can well believe there are people who are simultaneously atheists and believers. And I think I'm one of them. <laughs> okay. Now, in dealing with the human condition, there are two types of questions that emerge, and I think many of us tend to get, get these categories confused, and that, that's dangerous. And this is, of course, metaphysics and science. I'm sorry, I'm stating very elementary things, but maybe some of you in the audience don't know, don't know this. Uh, metaphysical questions like, why do I exist? What is the meaning of existence? Uh, what, what happened before the Big Bang? And, and there are some questions which are, occupy the blurred boundary between metaphysics and science. Questions that used to be metaphysical questions are can now be deemed to be belong to science. But I'm going to steer clear of metaphysics in this lecture, stick to neurology and science. And the best I can hope to do is to talk about neurological syndrome, which have some philosophical implications. Not the syndromes I already told you about, that will take an entire course to do, but I'm just going to focus on three aspects of the mind. One is a condition called synesthesia, described by Francis Galton. I talked about this in detail in the very first lecture. So I hope there's not too much of an overlap in the audience. I'm going to repeat some of that. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about intrasensory abstractions, which humans excel at. And I'm going to talk about the mirror neuron system. Again, I touched on this topic in my lecture uh, on Monday. But I'm going to elaborate on some of these ideas and discuss especially its relevance to understanding autism, both its clinical implications of mirror neurons and its theoretical implications for aspects of human evolution. So first, synesthesia was a condition described by Francis Galton, who noticed that a certain proportion of the population were otherwise quite normal. And people used to think this is a very rare condition, one in 10,000, one in 1,000 people had synesthesia. But we have found that one in 50 people, one in 100 people have synesthesia, depending on what kind of synesthesia you're talking about. Synesthesia is a condition where a person who's otherwise quite normal will claim that letters of the alphabet or numerals written on a sheet of paper look colored. And some of them will claim they can actually see the color perceptually, not just visu visualize it or imagine it, right? And, uh, or when they hear specific tones, F sharp is blue, C sharp is green, and so on and so forth. So this merging of the senses, getting the senses muddled up, is called synesthesia. And many, there are hundreds of case reports of synesthesia since Galton's time, since the 19th century. But people thought they were curiosities, and the, and the syndrome was just brushed under the carpet, as often happens in science. What Thomas Kuhn would call an anomaly doesn't fit the mainstream of scientific understanding when you say 
five is red or six is blue, we tend to ignore it and engage in a sort of form of denial. But we would like to argue that, in fact, it, pro it provides a key to understanding several elusive aspects of the mind, such as creativity and metaphorical thinking. Now, what's causing synesthesia? Well, the first question is, is it even real? Or the patient just making it up? And one widespread view of synesthesia was, well, it's known, for example, synesthesia is eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists. And this already made people suspicious. They said, well, maybe it's something flaky, you know. And then maybe these people are crazy, right? What do you mean when somebody says five is red and six is blue? It doesn't make any sense. So that's one theory, but that's not fair. And I don't think it's, even if it's true, there's not much you can do, deal with it. So let's, let's throw it away. Um, there, there's, there are a couple of other theories. One theory is these are just memory associations from childhood. It's just people playing with refrigerator magnets. Um, that is, we all play with magnets in childhood. Five is red and six is blue and seven is green different magnets of different colors. Maybe for some reason we're stuck with these memory associations. This, this begs the question of why only some of us, some, some people have synesthesia. We all play with magnets, why don't we all have synesthesia? Secondly, why does synesthesia, something Galton noticed was synesthesia runs in families. And th there may be a genetic basis to it. So if, if it's refrigerator magnets, why does it run in families? We have to say the same magnets are being passed down from generation to generation. <laughs> or something silly like that. Uh, now, the third theory is that these people are on drugs, like LSD or pot. Uh, they're acid junkies. And there is some truth to this, because synesthesia is much more common among habitual users of LSD, and other, so and other drugs, than in the normal population. But you do f see many synesthetes who have never been on drugs, so that can't be an explanation. Although it's an interesting question why these drugs enhance synesthesia. Now, the fourth idea about synesthesia, which I think is more intriguing, maybe on the right track, is the notion that these people are being metaphorical. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what do I mean by a metaphor? Well, let's say you say cheese is sharp, cheddar cheese is sharp. Well, cheese is not sharp. If you rub it on the skin, it's soft. So you say, well, no, I mean the taste is sharp. But that's circular. Why do you use a tactile metaphor to describe a gustatory sensation, right? And there are many examples of these intersensory metaphors. Why do you use them? But I'd like to argue that I was a bit uncomfortable with the theory that synesthesia is just, is just being metaphorical. Because in science, you can't solve one mystery with another mystery. Saying synesthesia, well, that's just a metaphor. It doesn't tell you a damn thing. Because what is a metaphor? We don't know what the neural basis of metaphors are in the brain. So in fact, what I'd like to do is turn it upside down and argue that synesthesia is a concrete sensory phenomenon whose neural basis you can pin down in the brain, as we shall see. And that, in turn, may give you an experimental lever or a foothold for understanding more complex, elusive, enigmatic aspects of mental function, such as metaphor and creativity. So that's the journey I'm going to take you on from synesthesia, this quirky phenomenon you see in some people, which may have a genetic basis, all the way to Shakespeare and metaphor. So the first thing we needed to do is to show that these people are not crazy. And we found it's very common, one in 50 people have synesthesia. I found two students in my class who had synesthesia. They would see five is red and two is green, or two is red and five is green. And we found there are two kinds of synesthetes, roughly speaking. The first kind are what we call projectors or uh, lower synesthetes. These people would claim when you ask them. Several obvious questions you can ask a synesthete, questions that come to mind immediately. You draw the letter five on a piece of paper and ask him, what do you see? He says, I see red. And you say, first thing I asked him was, do you actually see red or does it make you think of red? He says, no, no, I actually see the red. What do you mean make, make, make me think of it? I actually see the red. He said, where is it? Is it on the field? He said, it's actually superposed on the red. It's spreading, leaking out of the red five slightly. One of the remarks you hear. Sometimes they'll say, no, it's not leaking out. It's confined exclusively to the number five. You get different reports. But it's spatially localized on the red, on the letter five. Now, that's not true of all synesthetes. It was true of the first two synesthetes. Luckily, it was true of the first two synesthetes we studied. So what we did to prove that it was a real phenomenon, they were not faking it, and also to prove that it's a genuine, authentic sensory phenomenon, that they're really seeing the red color, was to construct this display made up of several fives scattered on the screen. Amidst them, embedded amidst them are some twos. It's hard, difficult to see. There's a two there, there's a two there, there's a two there. And the twos form a shape, which is a triangle or a square or a circle. And the subject's task is to say which shape it is, what shape is formed by the twos. When you show this to normal people, they take 
20, 30, 40 seconds to discern the shape and say, well, it's a triangle, it's a square, whatever. When you show it to a synesthete, he says, immediately says, oh, I see an upside down red triangle, sir. And he does it much faster, about three times as fast as a normal person. So if he's crazy, how come he's much better at it than us? Okay? When you ask him about the phenomenology, he'll say, I actually see a red triangle against a forest of greens. And, I, and it's perceptually quite vivid. So this already is telling you this is a perceptual sensory phenomenon, not some high level mental association. But then there's a second group of synesthetes where this is not true, we found, who do say things like, when I see five, I don't actually see the color of that, but I see the color red in my mind's eye. It's not localized spatially to where the number is. I see it in my mind's eye. We call these associators. So the first thought that occurs to you is maybe it's like a memory. So I asked this chap, you know, often you can learn a great deal by just talking to these people. You don't need to do any testing. So I asked this chap, well, what do you mean you see it in your mind's eye? Is it like when you think of Cinderella, when you, think of, when you see a picture of Cinderella, you think of a pumpkin or you think of a chariot? Oh, sorry, uh, what do you call it, a carriage? What do you, what, is it like that? Is it a memory? He said, no, it's not like that. I actually, it's irresistible. I see it in my mind's eye. And I can't see anything else, I can't think of anything else. When I see five, I see red in my mind's eye. It's not like when I see Cinderella, I can think of a pumpkin, I can think of slippers, and I cannot think of it if I don't want to and all of that. It's, it's, it's five, I always experience a, a color red. So there are these two types of synesthesia. We thought we would focus on the lower synesthetes because we thought it might be more experimentally tractable. So we said, well, what's causing the phenomenon? And Ed Hubbard and I were looking at brain atlases. Well, there are two questions we, we wanted to answer. First of all, what causes synesthesia? First of all, is it a real phenomenon? We've shown that it's a real phenomenon. Second question, what causes it? What parts of the brain are involved? Third question, who cares? What's a big deal? I mean, you've shown that synesthesia is caused by some mechanism in the brain. So why should I care about this? So I'm going to uh, tell you what are the implications. When we looked at brain atlases, what we found was the color area of the brain, shown there in green, discovered by Samir Zeki, is in the fusiform gyrus. This is where color information is analyzed in the brain. And right next to that, in the red outline, is the number area in the brain, which is analyzing the shapes of numbers. And that was discovered by Stanislaw Dehane and by Tim Record working at our center. And we were struck by the fact that they're right next to each other. Now, what's the chances of synesthesia, of number color synesthesia, being the most common type of synesthesia, and these two areas being right next to each other, simply by coincidence. We said this is unlikely to be a coincidence. Maybe what's happening in these patients, or not these patients, these people, is that there is some accidental cross-wiring in their brains between the number area and the color area in the fusiform gyrus, so that every time they see a number, they see a color. Now, why should there be this cross-wiring? So our idea was that maybe in the early infancy or in the fetus, everything is connected to everything in the brain. Obviously, that's a gross oversimplification, but it's approximately true. There's a tremendous redundancy of connections. And then there are pruning genes which come and eliminate the excess connections, prune away the excess connections to create the characteristic modularity or specialization that characterizes the adult brain. Now, if there's a mutation in the pruning gene, there's defective pruning, then there's an excess of connections in the brain. And if, in addition, that pruning gene is expressed selectively or in a patchy manner, selectively expressed in the fusiform gyrus, which can happen, then you get number color synesthesia. Every time you see a number, a number of neuron is activated, and it spontaneously cross-activates a color neuron in the brain. Therefore, every time you see a five, you see a color red, six is color green, and so on and so forth. We tested this using brain imaging. When you show a normal person a black and white five or six, it activates only the number area in the brain. If you show them a colored five or six, I'm thinking, talking about normal people, non-synesthetes, if you show them colored numbers, it activates both the number area and the color area, obviously. But if you show a synesthete, a black and white number, it activates both the number area and the color area, showing that our hypothesis is essentially correct. More recently, Romka Rolt, who visiting our lab recently, but she has shown um, independently that, in fact, if you do diffusion tensor imaging, which is an imaging technique that allows you to see actual white matter, the connections between brain areas, in synesthetes, you find this greater white matter connecting the color area and the number area than in normal people. In lower synesthetes, in, in the, what I call the projectors, but not so much in the higher synesthetes. So it doesn't get better than that in neuroscience, where you have a 
uh, flaky, enigmatic perceptual phenomenon. People don't even, don't even know it's real. You do some very simple experiment, it takes a few hours to show these people are not making it up, they're really seeing the colors, they're not fudging it, and then postulating what's going on in the brain, doing a brain imaging experiment, functional brain magnetic resonance and MEG, showing you the number area, lights up the color area, in synesthetes, and then showing actual wires between these two areas enhanced in synesthesia using diffusion tensor imaging. Now then your next question is, well, so, so what? You explain synesthesia. Well, the clue comes from what I said earlier about synesthesia being ten, eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists. Now why should that be? So here is a link between synesthesia and creativity. Why should there be a link? So now imagine that the same defective pruning gene, synesthesia mutation, instead of being expressed selectively in the fusiform gyrus, is expressed diffusely throughout the brain. Imagine further that concepts and ideas are also represented in far-flung brain regions, with specific brain regions. Then if you have excessive connections across the brain, it gives you greater opportunity to link seemingly unrelated concepts and ideas, which is the basis of creativity and metaphor. As the example I gave you in my first lecture, where I, where I mentioned the example of it is the east and Juliet is the sun from Shakespeare. It is the east and Juliet is the sun. You don't say, well, does that mean Juliet is a glowing ball of fire? Your brain immediately says, or you say, no, it means she's nurturing like the sun. She's radiant like the sun. Uh, she's warm like the sun. She's the center of my solar system like the center of the sun is the center of the solar system. Um, so on and so forth. Your brain forms all the right links. And Shakespeare, of course, is master of this. We don't know if he was a synesthete. Maybe there are Shakespeare scholars in the audience who can answer this. But so the general idea is this is why the synesthesia gene survived in the general population. Why would one in 50 people have this quirk in their brains that makes them see numbers like five is red and six is blue? To be sure, this does not um, annoy. People with synesthesia are not annoyed by their condition. They, in fact, feel their lives are enriched by the synesthesia. They say the world is much more colorful, A, and B, they can remember phone numbers much more easily. Because when they think of a phone number, they see a palette of colors, and they say that helps them actually memorize the phone number more easily. But that can't be why it evolved, to remember phone numbers. So why did the gene persist in the population? It would have been weeded out a long time ago by natural selection if it were useless. My idea is that it has a hidden agenda, like the sickle cell anemia gene. The sick hidden agenda is it makes some people in the population more metaphorical, if you like, or more creative. And that's why the gene is so prevalent. In other words, when you have the synesthesia gene, because of defective pruning, each word, when you think of a word or idea, as being in some part of the brain, a small patch of neurons or a network in a part of the brain. If you have synesthesia, there's a bigger penumbra of associations associated with that word label. And therefore, if you have two words that are bigger penumbras of association, there's a greater opportunity of overlap between the two penumbras, like Juliet and the sun. A lot of things different between Juliet and the sun. Juliet is a young, young lady. The sun is the center of the solar system. They have nothing in common, except that they're radiant and warm and so on and so forth. So each word has a penumbra of meaning and neural connections. These connections are more diffuse in synesthetes than in normal people. This is just pure speculation. And so the penumbras overlap more, permitting greater opportunity for metaphorical thinking. Okay. Now, consistent with this theory that synesthesia involves early sensory cross-activation, not some high-level memory association, We've done some other simple experiments. One was the brain imaging. Other was the psychophysical experiment showing pop out of the colored numbers against a colored background. Another experiment we did, uh, pardon me for those who have seen it. Who, who, have, who has seen this already, by the way? Only about six people. OK, that's OK, good. Or 10 people. OK, people who have not seen it, can you read anything here? You can't read it, OK. I want to show you what it is by blurring it. Can you read it now? Raise your hands, please. Okay. Or even more blood. Those are, can everybody read it now? Okay. And we'll go backwards. Now, once you've seen it, it's easier to see, but you still can't see it. You need to blur your eyes. Squint your eyes a bit, then you can see it. Now, the amazing thing is if you show this picture to a synesthete, to a letter color, synesthetes also see colors with letters, not just with numbers. They say, oh my God, I see colors there. That's red and that's green, that's yellow, that's chartreuse, that's indigo, but there are no, Letters there, I see the colors, but there are no letters. 
oh, wait a minute, now I see the num letters. Okay, I'm starting to see the numbers now. And so he starts inferring the, the letters from the colors that are evoked. This is very important because what it's showing you is the color evoked by the grapheme, by the letter of the alphabet, happens even before the conscious recognition of the grapheme. That means it must be processed very early on. This is consistent with our physiological observation. General idea is maybe the hidden letters, which are not available to consciousness initially, go and activate the fusiform gyrus, the grapheme area, but this does not reach consciousness, therefore they're not seen consciously. But they nonetheless cross-activate the color neurons here. Therefore, the appropriate color is seen even before you consciously recognize the letters. And the, page, the subject is actually using the colors that are evoked to infer consciously what the letters might be. Is that clear? So this is direct proof. It's a form of blind sight, if you like. It provides direct proof that the processing of, that synesthesia is not a high-level memory association or a cognitive process. That is an early sensory process because even an invisible letter can evoke the appropriate color. And you can then use that color to info, infer what the letter must be. Another example here. One of these is a bit strange or different from the others. Everybody knows what that is? Anybody knows what that is? Raise your hand if one of them is different. One of those words is different. You say one of those words, yeah. Well, it turns out, I don't, I don't remember which one. I think it's that one there. It's a, pure, it's a mirror reversed word. All the others are just nonsense. One of them is purely mirror reversed. Now the synesthete looks at it. It turns out one of the things about many synesthetes is if you rotate, flip the letter left, right, it retains its color. So green, red, you write it a mirror image version, it's still green. Same, same with the other mirror image letters. So the synesthete looks at this and says, oh, that's, 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 that's a word, real word, it's mirror flipped, the others are all non-words. And I say, how do you know? He says, well, I see them all colored, these are not colored. These are all colored and they form a word. Now that again is interesting because he's suggesting that the synesthetic colors are evoked prior to the actual recognition of each letter. Now the other interesting observation we made, which is relevant to the philosophical problem of qualia, is that we ran, believe it or not, we ran into two synesthetes who are colorblind. Okay, so here is a synesthete who says, I don't see the colors in the real world, or a very restricted range of colors in the real world, because of deficiency in the cone pigments in the eye. But when he sees numbers, he sees the numbers richly colored. He sees numbers, he sees colors and numbers which he cannot ever experience in the real world. So he refers to them charmingly as Martian colors, or alien colors. Now why would this happen? Well, my theory explains it very nicely, of course. <laughs> and that is the numbers in this chap, because of deficient, because the retina, the eye is deficient in cone pigments, it can't see the colors, but the letters are processed, the black and white letters are processed, and the color area in the brain in these people is hardwired and intact, and it's sitting there in the brain. So the color neurons are all still there. So what you're doing is by showing numbers, you're bypassing the retina, you don't need the color receptors there, going, activating the fusiform area, number area there, and then that's cross-activating the color, so he sees colors which he can never see in the real world. Is that clear? Right? Because you're, taking, you're, taking, you're bypassing the retina altogether, even though there are no color receptors there, and he's color blind. And you go activate the color, the number of neurons in the brain, cross activate the color neurons, and he sees these Martian colors that you never see in the real world. Again, a powerful vindication of our idea that synesthesia is a sensory process occurring early in visual processing stream. Now, I want, I want to say that this is not the whole story, even though the cross-activation between number and color happens early on in visual processing. That's obviously not the whole story because you can create a display like this, a five made up of tiny little threes. The question is, what do you see? You can kind of have fun and try and frustrate the subject. See what, you know, how can you confuse the subject and, and annoy the subject? So the subject says, I say, well, I, he says, oh, well, I see, when I look at the individual numbers, when I look at the details, I see red because three is red. But when I see it as a whole, apprehend the whole image as a gestalt, then I see color, color corresponding to the five, I see it red, the whole thing is red. So I can switch my zoom lens to see the fives or the, or the, the threes of the fives, and the color changes accordingly. So even though it's based on cross-activation in the fusiform, the manner in which you categorize or, or conceptualize the sensory input using top-down processing 
can influence the color that you walk. Exactly what's happening in the visual pathways, we don't know, of course. Uh, another piece of evidence showing that it's an early sensory process, we discovered this amazing observation that in synesthetes, the numbers are colored most vividly near central vision. If you put the same A or B outside in the periphery, even though it's equally visible, it's not colored. So you have a synesthete looking here, and you have number five here, it's red. You put a number five here, even, it's made, even though you make it big enough to see clearly, it's not colored. This again suggests an early sensory process, otherwise why would it matter what the eccentricity is? So we've taken this quirky phenomenon, synesthesia, it's a lovely example of cognitive neuroscience in action, and gone from genes which have not yet been identified, but we think there must be some gene or genes coding for this syndrome, to brain anatomy, fusiform gyrus, um, where we did brain imaging to show that this is what's going on, to perceptual psychophysics, the pop art experiments, colorblind synesthete and all of that, uh, and then all the way to metaphor, abstract thinking in Shakespeare. Now, this got me thinking about, so synesthesia is an example of abnormal cross-activation, cross-sensory interaction between color and number, between sound and color, so on and so forth. But it got me thinking about normal intrasensory interactions. Right? You have five tones and five dogs. You say, oh, what they have in common is fiveness. This is an example of intrasensory abstraction. Right? So it got me thinking about that, and I came across this old observation by Curler and uh, um, Heinz Werner, which is called sound, sound shape correspondence. We call it the Buba Kiki effect, and we started using it for studying intrasensory interactions, and especially we're interested in the emergence of language and the role that this phenomenon might have played in the emergence of language and metaphorical thinking, especially metaphor. So I'm going to show you that in a sense, you're all synesthetes, right? You're all closet synesthetes, and have these profound intrasensory interactions. What I have here are two Martian alphabets. Just like you've got A, the shape A is A, and B is B, and C is C, here you have Martian alphabet. One of these is Kiki and the other is Buba. Okay? How many of you think that's Kiki and that's Buba? Raise your hands, please. Okay, there's one or two mutations, but how many of you think this is Buba and this is Kiki? Raise your hands. All right, ninety nine point nine percent of you. Other two can come and see me afterwards. <laughs> now, why did those of you raise your hands and say, that's Buba and that's Kiki? I've never, you're, none of you is a Martian. I've never taught you Martian. You've never seen these displays before. Why did you spontaneously say that's Buba and that's Kiki? Well, it's because the, the sharp inflection of the visual contour here mimics the Kiki inflection of the sound, Kiki, the sudden inflection of the sound, not to mention the tongue hitting the palate and being pulled down was Kiki. So, the brain is seeing the abstracting across modalities. This may sound like a, a sort of amusing little demonstration, but it's actually quite profound. So what it's telling you is, just think about it. This visual shape kiki is just a bunch of photons hitting your retina in parallel. The sound kiki is a bunch of hair cells being excited in your, in your ear sequentially. The pattern of activity is produced in your auditory cortex by the sound kiki, and the visual pattern being produced in your fusiform gyrus or wherever utterly dissimilar from each other. And yet the brain extracts the common denominator, the kikiness or the jaggedness of the sound, or in this case, the tongue undulating on the palate, a booba, and the, and the undulating amoeboid shape is being extracted by the brain. And therefore this process of abstraction which we human beings excel at is being illustrated by this simple illusion. Now, there are two other points I wish to make. First of all, this has relevance to metaphors as well. Because what is a metaphor other than abstracting across two seemingly unrelated things, like Juliet and the sun? One is a young woman, the other is a central solar system. They have nothing in common, and yet they do have something in common, and that's what you pull out and call the metaphor, right? And the same thing here, the, the, the kiki, the visual shape is a bunch of photons versus a bunch of hair cells being excited sequentially, and the tongue hitting the palate. They have nothing in common, but the brain abstracts the common denominator and extracts it. So it's a form of metaphor, metaphorical thinking. Now the next question is, a fascinating question, and that is, why did this ability emerge? Right? Why, why do you want to do kiki booba? How did it emerge in humans? And I think it has something to do with our tr climbing trees, right, and jumping from branch to branch, or reaching out to grab a branch. 
when you're doing prehension. When you reach out and grab a branch, say the branch is oblique or vertical or horizontal, you would adjust all your muscles accordingly, produce appropriate sequence of muscle twitches, and adjust all the joints accordingly, you're going to reach out horizontally, vertically, obliquely. This is all done by the premotor and motor cortex. And the pattern of sequential muscle activation, the neurons to be activated sequentially, is utterly different from the oblique pattern of photons hitting your eye, it's vertical, horizontal, or oblique. The brain, again, has to do cross-domain mapping, abstracting across maps. And that's why this ability evolved in early primates. But once it evolved, and it evolved, I believe, in a structure called the inferior parietal lobule, especially in the left hemisphere. Because when you damage that lobule, you get phenomenon called abs uh, apraxia, which is difficulty in performing skilled action. Now, once that lobule evolved for looking at vertical and horizontal shapes, matching photons with pre prehension and manipulation, muscle twitches, once you have that abstraction module in place, you could use it for other types of abstraction, like sound and vision, Puba Kiki, or maybe even things like metaphor and abstract thinking. Now, how do you test an outlandish view like that, that from treetops to metaphor? Well, you look at patients who have sustained injury to the inferior parietal lobule. Well, first of all, how do you know even what I'm saying is true? So what I'm claiming is that region, the inferior parietal lobule, especially the angular gyrus, evolved up in the treetops, primarily to negotiate branches in the treetops, and then became exapted or used to engage in other types of more sophisticated abstraction. Now, how do we know this? Well, one, we don't know this directly, but one clue comes from the fact that the inferior parietal lobule became accelerated in, in its size in evolution, especially in, in early primates and subsequently early arboreal primates when they started climbing trees, became even bigger in the great apes and finally became enormous in humans, especially on the left side. So they're about five or six times bigger in the left side in human cortex, proportionately larger than in lower primates, and in lower primates proportionately larger than in lower mammals. Right? So something went, underwent accelerated ev the evolution in the last 500,000 years. And when an anatomist sees that, immediately you know it's something, doing something very important and unique. Not only did it become larger, the left inferior parietal lob lobule in humans and humans alone split into two smaller lobules, one of which is called the supramarginal gyrus, left hemisphere, and the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere. Again, the supramarginal gyrus is involved in performing skilled action. If I ask a patient with damage to the supramarginal gyrus to salute, he'll do this. To comb his hair, he'll do this. To hammer a nail, he'll do this, right? So he cannot perform skilled actions anymore. Similarly, the angular gyrus of the left hemisphere is involved in all sorts of things which we regard as being human. So it's involved in arithmetic, in counting, in judging left and right, in, in uh, reading, in writing, all the basics you learn in school. Is, is, the angular gyrus, I'm not saying it's located in the angular gyrus, the angular gyrus is playing an important role in some of these abilities. Now the next question, obvious question is, given what I've said about the emergence of abstraction from some of these other abilities like intrasensory abstraction, emergence of metaphor, if the angular gyrus is damaged on the left side, if the inferior parietal lobule is damaged on the left side, what happens to your ability to comprehend metaphor? So we found several patients, four patients, many of them actually were from India, and the patient had difficulty in calculation, as many of these patients do, uh, but he was otherwise fine. His, his, his speech was a little bit impoverished of words, difficult finding words, but perfectly intelligent chap, discussed politics with me, played play chess, he was in fact a physician, and he had developed a damage to the left angular gyrus. We did brain imaging and showed that and had, did some clinical testing. And we asked him, all that glitters is not gold, what does that mean? Can you explain what that means? All that glitters is not gold. He said, well, it means that if something is shiny and yellow, it doesn't mean it's gold, it could be copper. And I said, well, I know that, but does it have any deeper meaning? He said, yes, because when you go to a jewelry shop, you have to be very careful. Right? Because they, they may, they may, there may be an alloy, it could be. You have to take the specific gravity to make sure it's gold. I said, beyond that, there's any deeper meaning. He said, well, no, I don't think so. So this ability to see, this tendency to latch on to the literal meanings of proverbs and metaphors, we see, we've seen in several patients with damage to the left angular gyrus. So we think that we're on the right track in thinking that intrasensory abstraction evolved in this region of the brain to grab trees on branches. 
and then evolved further into engage in other types of abstraction, including what we call metaphorical thinking. Now, what I'd like to do now is to tell you a little bit about the mirror neuron system, and I already touched on this topic in my previous lecture on Monday, but I'd like to return to the topic and discuss it in more detail. How are we doing for time? Do you have another 15 minutes? Okay, 25 minutes, okay. All right, so let's switch gears now and talk about a group of neurons which were discovered by Giacomo Rizzolatti at Parma in Italy about 10 years ago. These are called mirror neurons. Now it turns out in the front of the brain, in the premotor cortex, roughly in the region of the Broca's area uh, in humans, but in monkeys in the premotor cortex, and also it turns out in humans, there are cells which send out motor commands for you to perform specific actions. So when I reach out and grab this bottle, cells in my premotor cortex and motor cortex are firing away. These are called motor command neurons. And they're orchestrating the precise sequence of muscle twitches required for me to reach out and grab that bottle. Similarly, there's another neuron, a small set of neurons, for putting something in my mouth. Another neuron for pushing something. Another neuron for pulling something. These are all motor command neurons discovered by Werner Mountcastle about 50 years ago. Now what Rizzolari found was some of these neurons, about 15%, 20% of them, quite a large fraction of them, will respond not only, so my motor command neurons, when I reach out and grab a cup or a peanut or a pen, so I reach out and grab a pen, the neuron fires and I reach out and grab a pen. This is my motor command neuron in my left hemisphere, in my left premotor cortex. Now some of these neurons will fire when I simply watch Susan, watch you reach out and grab the pen. This is extraordinary. It doesn't involve telepathy or anything like that. What it's saying is this neuron is allowing me to put myself in Susan's shoes and look at the world from her point of view, from her vantage point. It's constructing a theory of her mind and her intentions. In other words, it's doing a virtual reality simulation of her mind or her brain, looking at the world from her vantage point, right? So when I look, looked at this discovery, when I was listening to a lecture by Giacomo Rizzolari, and I nearly jumped off my seat, and I said, this has to be one of the most important discoveries in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, it turns out, just like there are mirror neurons for, and of course, it's easy to see, these neurons should be important for things like imitation, so I'm trying to imitate some skill that you've just performed, and I'm watching you. I have to temporarily adopt your point of view to perform the skill accurately, to mime or mimic the skill, and learn the skill, skill accurately. This has important implications for human, evolu human evolution, as we shall see. Now, just as there are motor mirror neurons, there are also sensory mirror neurons here, the postcentral gyrus, which is a complete map of the body surface, the surface of the brain. Just as there are motor neurons here for motor commands, there are sensory neurons here that receive signals from the body surface, touch signals. There are pain neurons in the insular cortex here, and also in the anterior cingulate, which you can't see here. Different parts of the brain responding to pain. There are neurons responding to pain, responding to touch. This has been known for over 50 years. But what some people have observed in the last five years is there are sensory mirror neurons, just like there are motor mirror neurons, which fire. So when my peanut grabbing neuron or pencil grabbing neuron fires, when I watch Susan reach for a, pen, reach for a pencil, the neuron is telling higher centers in the brain, look, the same neuron is firing as would fire if you reach out and grab a pen. Therefore, Susan is reaching out and grabbing a pen, allowing me to re read her intentions. Similarly, the sensory neuron, the pain mirror neuron, will fire when somebody pokes me with a needle and I say, ouch, and I withdraw my hand. My pain neuron in anterior cingulate and insula will fire. But the same neuron will fire some of the, well, when somebody, and I'm simply watching Susan being poked with a needle. So it's empathizing with Susan. However, now this is an interesting, important point to bear in mind. Even though the same pain neurons are firing, or a fraction of them is firing, when somebody pokes Susan and I'm simply watching her being poked, as when I'm being poked, I don't literally feel her pain. I don't say, ouch, and withdraw my hand. So even though the, the mirror, mirror pain neuron or mirror touch neuron is saying, in effect, look, the same thing is happening to Susan as would happen to you if you were poked with a needle, therefore empathize with Susan. That, did I say that too fast? So there are neurons in my brain, in the sensory regions in my brain. Which, which fire when somebody pokes me with a needle, my thumb. So they say, ouch, you're being poked with a needle. 
Some of these neurons will fire, same pain neurons will fire when some, I simply watch Susan being pulled, and they fire. So why don't I say, ouch, and withdraw my hand, right? The answer is my skin is intact. This intact skin, receptors in the skin are going and informing my brain, these pain centers in the brain. Look, don't worry, you're not being poked. So by all means, empathize with Susan, but don't literally fail, feel her pain, right? So this neuron, this input, sensory input is going and vetoing, partially vetoing the output of the mirror neuron system and saying don't literally feel her qualia. So guess what happens? To test this theory, we just looked at the patient who had an amputation, looked at the patient with a phantom limb. And in the 100 years of research in phantom limbs, nobody had observed this simple thing. When a patient has a phantom limb, let's assume I'm the patient with a phantom limb, I simply watch Susan being poked with a needle. I feel the poking needle in my phantom limb and, and I say, ouch. Right? You can do it any number of times. We've seen it in lots of phantom limb patients. They literally experience other people's sensations. We call this hyperempathy syndrome, and we therefore call mirror neurons Gandhi neurons. Okay? Because look at what these neurons are doing. They're dissolving the barrier between you and other human beings. The only thing that's really separating you from me from Susan is the bloody skin. Remove the skin, our qualia start merging into each other, our minds start melding with each other. This is the mainstay of many Eastern religious traditions, that the distinction between yourself and somebody else's self is to some extent arbitrary. Right? Now, this is the theoretical implication or philosophical implication. It also has practical implications. I think that's true of many of the things I've been telling you about. The practical implication is the following. If Susan is poked with a needle, I feel it in my phantom, and I say, ouch, and withdraw my phantom. This is absolutely useless, although it's telling you something important about the brain. But one of these patients went home, and telephoned me the next day. Now in phantom limbs, one of the things, first, first of all, those of you who don't know what a phantom limb is, when you arm, remove an arm, amputate an arm, an arm is lost in a car accident, in a crush injury, patients continue to vividly feel the presence of that arm. It's about 99% of patients will feel, it's not a rare condition, will feel the phantom, will feel the presence of an arm, it's called a phantom limb. And in about two thirds of patients, there's excruciating pain in the phantom, often localized to one part of the phantom, the hand or the thumb or the elbow, and sometimes the pain is so severe, the patient will contemplate suicide. On rare occasions, do commit suicide. Right? So it's a very serious clinical problem. There's no known treatment, except we devised this treatment using mirrors, which I mentioned on Monday. I'm not going to repeat it today. But here's another treatment. The patient phones me over the phone, and he says, look, sir, Professor Ramachandran, you know, you showed me the other day that when you massaged your own hand or poked your own hand, I felt the poking in my phantom hand, and I could feel the pain. Well, guess what? And I said, what? I was feeling excruciating, cramping sensations in my phantom hand, and I simply asked my wife to massage her own hand, and I simply watched her massage her own hand. I felt the phantom massage on my phantom, and the pain went away, right? And I said, try it as often as you can. And every time, sure enough, every time you watched his wife massage her hand, the phantom massage was enough to eliminate her phantom pain. Now, we've not done this on a systematic clinical basis, like we did with the mirror, but it surely deserves further investigation. It was even simpler than the mirror. You just have to have, look at your wife and have, have massaging herself when you experience the relief from phantom pain. Now that's the clinical implication of this observation. Theoretically, it has, the philosophical implication is this dissolution of barriers between your qualia and my qualia. Then there is also, so there are other theoretical implications for um, understanding emergence and evolution of the human mind. Now, there's, there's this debate about whether there's any single characteristic that makes us uniquely human. Obviously, we are special in many, many ways. We have sophisticated language, we have recursive, thing, recursive embedding, all sorts of things which are claimed, which it's claimed as uniquely human, or at least very, very, very good at. But I think what happened in evolution was we evolved several abilities in tandem, or this fortuitous co-emergence of several seemingly unrelated abilities, and equally fortuitous interactions, synergistic interactions between them. And this lead, led to an explosive, nonlinear, explosive development of the human mind and its many ex astonishing abilities. This is a somewhat different view from Pinker who ar argues for a uh, specific hill climbing type algorithm achieving a very sophisticated modules in the brain. So going back to the theoretical implications of mirror neurons, as I said, it's important for imitation. So if I look at somebody and I want to uh, and a, among apes, they, people think of the apes as great mimics. Actually, they're pretty crummy at it. In fact, orangutans actually are better than most apes. They can actually 
break into locks, open locks, when they simply watch somebody or turn a key in a lock and open, watching the keeper doing it. So if we get destroyed in a nuclear holocaust, then there's an isolated colony of orangutans somewhere in Sumatra. They may well inherit the earth <laughs> because they're very good tool users. But um, going back to mirror neurons, obviously one of the major advances in evolution took place about 100,000 years ago, 80, 90,000 years ago. It was a great leap forward. Sudden emergence of shelter, emergence of sophisticated multi-component tools, emergence of ornament, clothing, all of this took place relatively rapidly. It's been called the Great Leap Forward. Why did this happen? Well, what happened in evolution, as most people here would probably know, in human evolution especially, was that something which, let's take, let's say a polar bear, to evolve a fur coat must have taken two or 300,000 years through the painful, laborious process of natural selection. But a human child watching his mother slaying a polar bear, maybe the mother accidentally saw a dead polar bear in the first instance, started skinning, started lying next to the dead polar bear for warmth, then, then realized you could skin the polar bear and put it on, then realized you could actually kill the polar bear, and then, sorry, yeah, kill the polar bear and skin the polar bear and wear the skin. The human child watching this on one or two trials learns this by deploying a sophisticated mirror neuron system. So evolution suddenly became Lamarckian. All of a sudden, it's no longer Darwinian, no longer based on selection of genes, but suddenly, thanks to the advent of a sophisticated mirror neuron system, it became Lamarckian. We use a fire, for example. So any one, one outlier, an intellectual outlier or genius, discovers the use of fire. Immediately, it's transmitted in one generation, not across a hundred generations, the progressive accumulation of genes, but in one generation to the, to the offspring and laterally to other people in the, in the peer, peer group, and then sp spreads immediately. This is the dawn of culture, and the dawn of civilization. Okay. One final clinical implication of mirror neurons, and that is possible, it's possible relevance to autism. Now, autism is a, is, is a disorder that, that some, most of it is very much in the news these days, but it turns out to be not as rare as people used to think it was. And it's characterized by, first and foremost, by a lack of empathy, right? Lack of emotional empathy. Uh, lack of theory of mind, inability to take another person's point of view. It's one of the most characteristic symptoms of autism. Inability to engage in pretend play. Most normal children will pretend he's a superman or it's he-man is an action figure or a toy, can temporarily put his mind inside that action figure, look at the world from the point of view of that action figure. It's a rehearsal for adult role playing. Right? Autistic children don't do that. It's an impoverished language, as you all know, and there's a great difficulty with imitation and learning through imitation. Now, what does all this remind you of? Anybody? Obviously, mirror neurons. When I first heard Giacomo Rizzolatti giving a talk 10 years ago, at a Society of Neuroscience meeting, I jumped off my seat. Eric Altschuler, my postdoc, was sitting next to me, and I said, my God, this explains autism. How, how can it be that precisely the same list of symptoms you see in this autism are precisely the same properties of mirror neurons? And there are other theories of autism, by the way. One of my eminent colleagues, Eric Kurshain, who is uh, very eminent, but I disagree with him, he thinks the main culprit is the cerebellum, because you do see lesions in the cerebellum in autism. But you don't see, if you look at a patient with cerebellar damage, even a child with cerebellar damage, you don't see any of the symptoms of autism that I've listed here, except the mild ataxic gait. You don't see any of the other symptoms. Conversely, if you, you, you have an autistic child, you don't see any of the typical damage, signs of cerebellar damage, like intention tremor, ataxia, and any of the other signs. Of cere why, why would you need to invoke cerebellum? On the other hand, there's a tremendous overlap between the symptoms of autism and the pro purported properties of mirror neurons. So we have this idea, we went and tested this immediately using EEG, which is easy to do at that time, 10 years ago. And sure enough, we found deficits in the activity of the mirror neuron system and proposed the shattered mirror theory of autism 10 years ago. And then Lindsay Oberman, another graduate student of mine, joined my lab three years later, and she conducted a large-scale study on about 20, 20 autistic subjects, showing exactly the same thing, an impoverished mirror neuron activity. Since then, there have been at least seven or eight studies using functional brain imaging in autistic children showing a deficient mirror neuron system. I should add there is one study which claims that the mirror neuron system is completely normal in some autistic children, so you can't explain this. This doesn't bother me because it's one out of seven, A, and B, you have to bear in mind that 
This kind of heterogeneity is quite common in neuropsychology. It could be in the children he tested, it's not the mirror neuron system itself that's deficient, but the target zones in the brain that produce exactly the same symptoms as autism. Right? This is diabetes can be caused by deficiency in insulin, it can also be caused deficiency in the target receptors on the surfaces of cells. So similarly, there may be a heterogeneity in autism. But I think there's compelling evidence now. I would say the evidence is compelling but not conclusive that the deficient mirror neuron system is the cause of autism. There's a group in uh, Australia that are actually artificially trying to stimulate the mirror neuron system with transcranial magnetic stimulation and claim to relieve some of the symptoms in autism. So it may pave the way towards therapeutic, novel therapeutic approaches. Now, I think I'm going to stop there. I just want to say mirror neurons, we talked about clinical implications, theoretical implications, imitation learning, the dawn of civilization. So I'm reminded of, in giving these lectures, I haven't touched very much on theology or on God, except to mention the temporal of seizures causing experiences of God. But it does remind me of C.P. Snow's famous remark about two cultures, uh, this, the humanities on the one hand, literature, art, poetry, and religion, theology, all of that, and science, especially scientific materialism on the other hand, and never the twain shall meet, said, he said in the famous Reed lectures he gave. Well, I'm arguing that the brain provides the, the study of the human brain, whether through neurology or brain imaging or through single unit neurophysiology, doing the kinds of experiments that I've been talking about provides an effective bridge between the two cultures. Have we bridged the two cultures? I think we've barely scratched the surface, but the journey so far has been exciting. Thank you. I've had a few good ideas in my career so far. I plan to have a few more, but I think one of the best was persuading my colleagues on the Gifford Committee that we ought to ask Professor Ramachandran to come and visit and talk to us. So I'm just delighted. Thank you ever so much. Can we give another round of applause, please? <laughs> Thank you. That was really Now the plan is that we're going to have lots of time for questions and after some questions I'm going to invite the current chair of the Gifford Committee to come and give a vote of thanks. But now I'm going to open the floor up to questions. We have the first one here, we're going to... Oh, Paul, if you... Thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, with respect to experiences like out-of-body experience or near-death experience, how do you explain them neurologically? Okay, so you're asking out-of-body experiences, which are not that rare, quite common in neurology, and as you say, in near death. Uh, let, let's get to the near death later, but in terms of neurology, I think the mirror neurons are very much involved, because often what happens is in out-of-body experiences, the patient says he has the feeling that is hovering out there in space, looking at his own body from outside, or looking at events from another point of view. Now remember, that's exactly what the mirror neurons are doing. They're taking an allocentric view, which means view of your own, view of the world from another, from another vantage point, not from inside your, your own vantage point. And maybe mirror neurons can also turn, turn inwards, and not only look at other people from an allocentric point of view, but look at your own body from outside. So every time you deploy your mirror neurons, you're in a sense having an out-of-body experience. But, as I said with the pain, illustration with the pain, you don't literally float out of your body and experience an out-of-body experience. You just say, well, kind of metaphorically, I can, I can think of myself as looking at money from over there, that vantage point, through optical geometry or something like that, but I don't f find myself leaving my body and looking at myself there. And that may be because there's frontal inhibition of the mirror neuron system, which partly stops you from actually floating out and looking at people from outside. <laughs> and as this inhibition is removed, you start getting literally, so there's some dynamic interplay of signals from frontal inhibition mirror neuron system, which allows you an allocentric view of the world and of your own body, and feedback coming from the body, this triadic interaction between these two anchors your own mind in your body. When that's messed up, you start feeling you're leaving your body and looking at yourself from outside. And so, of course, a hypoxia can cause similar messing up in near, during near-death experiences. Uh, 
just two things about it. The first thing is when you say mess up, what do you mean? And the second is, in these cases, whether it's OBE or an near-death experience, the brain is not as active as you know the situations where you mentioned most of the cases. So there, when the brain is not as active, how do you explain the uh, working of the mirror neurons? And what exactly do you mean by mess up? It gets messed up, it stops working. I mean, it's just dysfunctional. In other words, in hypoxic states, so it's a question of threshold. Some neurons are more vulnerable to hypoxia than others. So you just mess up is just a colloquial term. I mean, it's just meaning it's dysfunctional. Right. It's just neural circuitry. Right. And in terms of the brain activity, because the brain is not as active, so how do you explain the neurological well, activity? Well, not active means that it's non-functional. So the, 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 this, this triadic interaction between the mirror neuron system and the frontal inhibition and some feedback, this is just speculation. But that's what you mean. You mean there's functional inactivation of some regions of the brain due to the hypoxia that's causing a temporary lesion, if you like, a temporary sense of having you're having left your body. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. We have Paul right over here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a question with regards to synesthesia and Chinese writing. Do they have 50,000 different colors, or? <laughs> <laughs> it's a question for you. Well, Dr. Bach, yeah. Theoretically, you could have preflu and radical with different colors. Right. I mean, the, the, I mean the, the characters are not like a random collection of, the characters are not random collection of uh, strokes, as we might believe, but they are put together from different radicals. It can be two, three, four, and so on. Very often one codes for the pronunciation and for meaning. So in a way, that would radically reduce the number. It could be that the radicals are associated with colors, but I don't know if it's Question. Present. Something we plan to investigate. Thank you. Um, going back to Kiki and what was the other one? Buba. Buba, um, you took us immediately to leaping from tree to tree. Um, at what point did primates start to, if not use language, make um, sort of sounds uh, of warning and so forth? Because could a simultaneous or alternative explanation be to do with onomatopoeia? You, yes. you the creature, want to signal or express that there is a running stream yes. or there is the wind in the trees or there's something that yeah, yeah makes a certain yeah, and yeah. that's that's how the, the the association with for us the kikis and the and the boobas the language yeah. comes yeah. that's a very fascinating question okay yes yeah. speaking of onomatopoeia um, i think that we have to think about language as many different functions including recursiveness we were talking about earlier. But I think an important aspect of the language is the acquisition of words, that is an extraordinary range of words that the human brain has, vocabulary. And how did this first emerge, these words? Did we all sit around the fireplace and say, banana, let's all say banana, a bunch of ancient hominids. Of course they didn't, almost certainly, right? So this, this is the Sejirian theory of language that in fact the link between word and appearance is arbitrary. Sound of the word, what is pig or dog? There's nothing dog, dog like about a dog. It's called kutta in, in, in uh, Hindi and nai in Tamil and shen in, in, in French. So these words have nothing in common, right? But what I'm arguing is, we go back in time, the ancient proto words, they may in fact be onomatopoeic in origin, and this buba kiki effect supports that idea, right? So, for example, we say if something you, your foot sticks in mud. We say trudge, sludge, smudge, fudge. It's all about the tongue. So there is this booba kiki like abstraction going on. So there are many examples of this sort of thing. I can't think, think on the top of my head, I can't remember, but there are dozens of examples. So once you've got these proto words in place, an approximate rule, syntactic rule, then of course you can start diversifying the words. And then they start acquiring the Sagerian quality. Does any of this make sense? Yeah. But initially, yeah, sorry. I mean, the 
early Chinese characters were practically exactly like you no know, sun was product sun and moon, and then with time they assumed more abstract uh, meaning and were put together. So in a way, we can practically see exactly what you describe for what we cannot trace for the evolution of the spoken language. We can see, in fact, an evolution of the written language in China. It's only a partial answer, I'm afraid, but. Beside this one, and then the person with the hand up and there is in the middle. Wait, just turn up. Keep going, keep going. There we are. So, Paul, if you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the talk. I just, wanted to, um, I just wanted to ask, in relation to the joining of the two cultures, the bridging of the two cultures that you mentioned, um, a similar argument is being made by one Sam Harris who argues for a sort of moral objectivism. He argues that. Uh, science and the understanding of the brain, if consciousness could be considered the basis, this, the basis of morality, then the study of the brain is the way paving forwards the way for a sort of objective morality. And I was just wondering what your views might be on that and if, if and you on, share similar views. On an objective moral existence of an objective morality. Or a moral objectivism to sort of. Yeah, I mean, that goes all the way back to Kant and moral imperative and all that. I, mean, basically, I don't know how brain science is going to solve that. It's going to enrich your understanding of morality, but and, and of course, without free will, there is no morality. And whether free, and with, uh, lots of books have been written on free will being an illusion. It's not something I've thought about in, in depth. But uh, my gut feeling is there is absolute morality, but I can't justify it. <laughs> and I, there's nothing you learn in neurophysiology that's going to make any difference. I think. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I, my colleague Pat Churchill would completely disagree with what I'm saying. But. That, that makes me more sure that I'm right. <laughs> you have this. Oh, there's, there's someone there, yes. Yeah, I'm uh, interested in this idea that at least some forms of synesthesia might be due to uh, less pruning in early development. Because I believe most of that kind of pruning happens uh, postnatally, so in the first few years of life. Yeah. So that would imply that you know, perhaps all of us is uh, babies and toddlers were all synesthetes. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that, and uh, is there any way you can test that in very young children? Well, it's hard to do so in anybody who's not learned the alphabet, or it's impossible to do or of numbers. But there may be primordial shapes, elementary shape constituents, letters in alphabet, which are linked to specific colors in early childhood. That's not been tested. It's po possible to test it by preferential looking and things like that. And I think Davida Teller. Maybe there's a, there, is, there are one or two people, developmental psychologists, who have started testing this idea. I don't know how far they've got, though. But it's a very interesting question. Hang on. Okay. Sorry, to answer that question, Karen Dobkins. Uh, I think she's in California. Yeah, she's my well, colleague. Yeah. She's okay. next she door is, to me. Yeah, she has done um, BEPs, I think, with babies and shown them. Most of them are synesthetes. Well, I don't know if I'd use the word synesthesia for that. They're more cross-modal yes. in interaction. Yes, yeah, they're not. Um, with respect to the mirror neurons, could, could these be used in rehabilitation? So, for instance, would it be enough for a stroke victim to watch hand reaching coordination and so that's to a very get good, some That's a very good question. And, of course, that we instituted that therapy. So the question is, was, can you tap into the mirror neuron system to accelerate recovery from stroke? And when we introduce a mirror technique, mirror feedback, I don't know if you heard my Monday lecture. Okay, the whole lecture was about, half of the lecture was about mirrors being used to treat phantom pain. And subsequently, very soon afterwards, we used mirrors to treat stroke. There's substantial recovery of function in some patients of uh, the paralyzed arm, hemiparesis, from simply using mirror visual feedback, giving them the illusion that the hand is moving, by looking at the reflection of the other hand moving. That has now been confirmed, we reported that 10, 15 years ago, now been confirmed in several clinical trials, yeah, especially by DOHL, D-O-H-L-E. So we think that's actually tapping in, partly the reason it works is, it works by tapping into a, some residual mirror neuron activity. Even though the majority of neurons have been damaged permanently by stroke, there are some mirror, some mirror neurons sitting there, dormant, not completely damaged, using the mirror you're activating them. Now, whether it would work by watching somebody else, probably but to a much more limited extent. But it's the same principle. Mm. Uh, 
chap up here, and then we're going over there, and we've got someone around here, and then we've got you. So, Paul, up here. In your Monday lecture, you described what it. What are you? Oh. Yeah, please stand up. This oh, will be better. In your Monday lecture, you described a particular illusion where experimenters manage to fool subjects into believing that their sensations originate in our inanimate objects. Yes. So the subject watches the experimenter stroke of a table and then eventually believes the sensation is coming from a table. Do you believe this illusion is only possible because of mirror neurons? And therefore, following on from that, is it harder to fool autistic people? No, it's a good question. <laughs> Whether autistic people are uh, susceptible to the illusion of assimilating a table into their body. You know, I, I know that somebody has tried it, in, uh, tried it in schizophrenia. I don't know why, but they tried it in schizophrenia and found some changes. But I don't, to my knowledge, it has not been tried on autistic. Following children. on from that, do you know of any autistic patients who have phantom limbs? Um, no. <laughs> but, but it's an interesting question. Yeah. Up there, but if we come round to this fellow here, I think I well, Ruth's going to come to that side. Oh, okay, <laughs> Ruth. It's very difficult orchestrating this, isn't it? <laughs> so there's a chap number four there. Yeah. This fellow here. Yeah. Hi. Um, is any of the conditions or the the areas of the brain that you study understood uh, computationally? Or How to what extent? Understood computationally. Yeah. I I'm not a great fan of computational okay. neuroscience. I mean, it's a good analogy up to a point. Mm -hmm. But from what we've seen, I don't know, in my Monday lecture, I talked about your metacarpal bone affecting your uh, left <laughs> inferior parietal lobule. It's hardly the sort of thing you'd expect from a computational model. Mm. Now, ultimately, anything can be modeled as an algorithm, right? But the question is, how useful is it from a heuristic standpoint? It is useful, but not something I pursue. Gentleman here. Uh, thanks. I uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, when you in synesthesia, you're talking about um, abnormal connections between different um, sort of sensory cortices. Mm -hmm. And have you ever come across um, an abnormal connection with a motor cortex? So a sensory input resulting in a, in a motor. Uh, yeah, it's a very response. good question. There is one case report from 20, 30 years ago of a sensory motor synesthesia where every tone evokes a sudden jerking movement in a specific direction. And other than that very stray report which has not been followed up, I don't know of any others. Sort of reminds you of dancing, of course. <laughs> because we all have a propensity to do that, but this is sort of a pathological, irresistible urge to move your hand in a specific direction. It's mentioned in my article in Journal of Consciousness Studies. There's a journal in America called Journal of Consciousness Studies. I wrote an article with Ed Hubbard called Synesthesia, a Window into Human Thought. And in that article, I mentioned that very specific study. Do you think... Sensory to motor. Right. Um, did you think these could relate in somehow to some of these rare epilepsy syndromes where you can... Um, seizures can be prompted by reading or, or, or eating in certain cases? And, and well, it depends on how broad you want to extend the idea of synesthesia being cross-connectivity in the brain. I mean, we're talking about a specific kind of synesthesia with numbers and colors, because we can, we can tackle it experimentally and explore, this, explore its broader significance. But then if you say anything where there's any situation where the connections change, if there's a synesthesia going on, it becomes less useful as a concept. But you're right. I mean, there are forms of epilepsy that are triggered by highly specific stimuli, where there's some kind of kindling might be going on, for instance. You know, my, my friend, my colleague, Dr. McGeough, has studied some of these phenomena, epilepsy. So there is that analogy there between synesthesia and some of those uh, symptoms you see in some seizure disorders. So the Thank chap you. who handed you the microphone is in fact the chap to ask? Because this is Professor McGurk. In fact, in, in temporal lobe <laughs> seizures, it's been claimed that in all of us, sensory input comes in, and you gauge the salience or significance of any event or object using your amygdala and other limbic structures in your brain. So you can respond appropriately. You can say, here's something important, here's something salient. But here is something utterly trivial like that little piece of paper there. Ignore it. You're creating a salient landscape of the world constantly as you interact with the world. But when you have seizures in the temporal lobe that enhance, that cause kindling, some of these connections may be indiscriminately enhanced, right? So everything becomes deeply salient, and you see infinity in a grain of sand, and you see God in a piece of paper, and everything seems deeply significant. This may explain partly the mystical experiences that they have. Not to detract in any way from the experience. Maybe everything is deeply significant, and we're the ones who don't see that and they see it. Right? 
but, but so that you could think of that as an extreme form of uh, synesthesia, if you like, between sensory input and, con and emotional salience. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, we, Ruth, we have someone. Oh, it's Mark Bailey up here. Hi, thank you. Um, I was going to ask a morality question, but I think you were warning us off doing that in one of your previous answers. Um, so I will ask another question instead, unless you insist. Um, you were talking about synesthesia genes and creativity and, and selection earlier in human evolution. Right. Um, you talked about the great step forward as happening somewhere in the region of 100,000 years ago, at least as left in the archaeological record. Um, the human, the last common ancestor of all humans lived about 200,000 years ago and most of our common genes in the population come from before that time. So I think you'd have to argue that creativity itself has to have been important if it drove anything in human evolution long before the evidence shows, at least a couple of hundred thousand years ago. So my question is, back then, what was so important so can, about... Can, I'm sorry. The question is very clear, but could you still repeat? Okay, uh, I'm imagining... I got, to, I got to the part about the creativity gene, but anyway, repeat the whole thing, sorry. Okay, I'm imagining a situation where creativity was important enough to act as a selective force in human evolution right. long before 100,000 years ago. Okay. Maybe 200,000, maybe 500,000, I'd argue even longer. Right. Um, so the, the question is, what was so important about creativity back then okay. uh, and w how, how important was it as a selective force potentially? Right. Well, I think there are two separate issues here. One is creativity and synesthesia and synesthesia genes and how they may have <coughs> emerged and what creativity, what uses creativity. So that's that, that set of questions. Other set of questions is mirror neurons and abstraction, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with creativity but with imitation learning. So the imitation learning causing an accelerate, accelerated Lamarckian evolution may have taken place 100,000 years ago. Creativity and creativity genes may have independently evolved 200,000 years ago, as you point out. But why it evolved, I, I left it out of my talk, and I have no idea your guess is as good as mine. I mean, it's kind of intuitively obvious why it might have been useful, but not, not, not in, de in, in any detailed manner. So it's a very good question. Okay, it looks like we have uh, one, two, Three, four, and five, and then we have to be. Oh, no. So, Ruth, you have someone beside you? Yes, here we are. Okay, in relation to the early portion of your lecture, you argued that synesthesia was a product of the lack of pruning of excessive connections in the brain, um, which result in the cross modal um, phenomena that you see in synesthesia. And you argued that this were um, this related to metaphor because me metaphor uses cross-modal. Um, Not necessarily cross-modal, but cross-domain. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would, I would argue that this could relate to autism, and because the. the Yes, the, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah because the relation of one of the key symptoms of autism is the inability to understand. Um, things like metaphor and sarcasm and in fact in one of your slides the list of symptoms for autism was an inability to perform pretend play yes. which it could be argued pretend play in itself is a form of metaphor an early form that's of metaphor. That's a very metaphor. good point you're, you're making additional links between mirror neurons and metaphor and yeah that so sort of the, could there be an issue of hyper pruning in early infancy that that contributes to autism. the yeah the uh, or deficit the deficits in autism. Well, I like your first idea that maybe defective pruning is also seen in autism. They would be bad at metaphors, and it's well known clinically. Many of them are bad at metaphors. So in addition to some of all the other symptoms I listed there, one of the additional symptoms I should add there, consistent with the idea of defective pruning, is, is the fact that they're bad at metaphor. But then the corollary of that, you're saying that there may be hyper, uh, hyper pruning as well? Yes. as a. Uh, uh, Yes. <laughs> it's an empirical observation, or are you saying you're predicting that? It's just speculation. But well, I, on that note, it turns out that some authors actually engage in excessive mimicry. It's always been a puzzle. You know, why is it some of them, some of it fits with what I'm saying, but some of them actually engage in excessive mimicry. 
I don't know if that fits what you're saying. There. Sorry, I, I have no comment on that. Good, it's a good point you raised. We have to hand this back, and then we have this chap here. And I think we probably have time. We probably don't have time for four more, but we're going to take. We have at least two more questions. People have had their hands up, and I'm going to. So please go ahead, sir. Hi. Um, in your first lecture, you mentioned the homong homunculus problem. Homunculus problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, can you talk a bit more about that? How comes that biological matter can create consciousness? How do you explain that to yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else asked me that question in the first, second lecture, I think. Yes. Yeah. How do you uh, believe consciousness arises in the brain? Um, well, I obviously, as a person studying brains and neurology, I believe that it has something to do with mental phenomena. And, but you know, the whole idea of localization, I think, breaks down. The idea that is mind localized inside the brain, I think is very misleading because our, our language is not refined enough to address those questions. It's a bit like saying you could adopt the view that metaphysical position that consciousness is like time, another dimension. People have suggested this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, each individual person is like a clock. And you don't say time is localized on the clock, even though the clock is monitoring the passage of time. You don't say time is inside the clock somewhere, let me look for that. But likewise, it could be that consciousness, to argue that consciousness is in the brain may be misleading, but clearly it's correlated with brain activity. What we're trying to ask is, is there any lawful, anything lawful about this correlation? Mm -hmm. Discovering those laws is, is what we do in neuroscience and, and psychology. But yeah, I, I believe that brain activity is involved in consciousness, but that's about as far as I'm willing to go. I think that's very brave to go that far. Now we have one here. I'm yeah. just going to come in quickly first. We had a question from uh, an audience member who's had to leave and who says, thank you for your very inspirational lectures. You mentioned synesthesia did not distinguish between a number and its mirror image, but your two and five are exact mirror images. Ah, yeah. fatal <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I, have to preface, what I have to say is that it varies from synesthesia to synesthesia. You know, they're not ma all made equal. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, but s sometimes in individual synesthetes, mirror image of the letter fail fails to evoke the color. It uh, has, has a completely different color. But in some of them, it preserves its color. But it's a good, very good question. Okay. Oh. Yeah, we have this chap first here with the purple. He's been waiting quite a long time. And then we have a lady with the yellow, because she's been waiting a long time. And then we have you, and I'm afraid that will be the final question. I do want to give as many people the opportunity, but I think we also have to um, call it a day. Yeah. I'm aware that you're not um, terribly keen on questions about morality, but I'm, I'm trying sorry, to ask this anyways. I, I'm aware that you're not terribly keen on questions of morality. Oh, yeah, okay. But this is a practical a aspect, so a maybe. Um, in criminals who, have, who are psychopathic and who lack empathy, who are unable yes. to exert empathy, do you think that the, the basis of our actions could be due to it a could deficiency well be, yes. in, in mirror neurons? Yes, it could very well be. It's a good, good question. It, it, lack of empathy in sociopaths, could that be attributed to impoverished mirror neuron system? It's an obvious hypothesis that comes to mind. It's hard to test sociopaths you know, in practical terms. That's why the only reason we haven't pursued it, but somebody ought to pursue that line of reasoning. And do you think there's a potential for rehabilitation as well? And maybe well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I've told you in autistic children, people are now doing transcranial magnetic stimulation to, to enhance the activity of mirror neurons. People also tried biofeedback to enhance the activity of mirror neurons. So some such procedure might, might help sociopaths. So. OK, we have this. Well, well, you have the microphone. So if you go ahead, and then we'll come to the, the wonderful yellow. Um, yeah, there. I was wondering about synesthesia. Does, uh, for instance, the color make one think of a number as well? Does it go there? Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. It's very interesting. You, you get numbers being colored, and if there's cross activation between these two areas in the brain, do you see colors evoking numbers? Question. The answer is 19 out of 20 times, you never see that. Uh, you, uh, that's a funny way of putting it. Okay. It's very, very rare to see colors evoking numbers. We don't know exactly why, but it may be that the nature of representation of color in the brain and the numbers in the brain permits only one-way activation. Because if you have a number, you can put it anywhere in the visual field and you can see that, a, that region is colored red or green. If you have a color evoking a number, where are you going to see the number? There's something inherently implausible about that. So the, 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 it depends on the manner in which these different dimensions are mapped onto the brain, and we don't really know. 
and may confer a unidirectional tendency in, 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 the, in the phenomenon. Not saying much, but something along those lines. Okay, we have one final question um, from the lady in the yellow. Please stand up. Hi, um, I just had a question about the concept of instinct. Like, um, I was wondering how neuroscience explains or defines it. Um, is it related to your past experiences or what you would like the future to be like? Um, well, by, an instinct by definition is something that's hardwired, usually quite a simple response to a, a stimulus in the environment. And that, that's the original definition of an instinct. It comes from ethology. So it's by definition nothing to do with the environment or interacting with it. It's something that's hardwired by genes. The only trouble is people now you think instincts underlie a lot of very complex phenomena. There's language instinct. There's a title of a famous book called The Language Instinct. But that's a very controversial topic. Okay. Could I thank you very much, Professor mm -hmm. Ramachandran. Um, I'd like you, please, to thank wait. You. Wait, everybody. We're going to be a vote of thanks. And that was wonderful. Thank so you. If you would like to join us. Uh, my name is David Jasper, the chair of the Gifford Committee. Uh, when Susan suggested that we invite our speaker uh, this evening, there was no hesitation whatsoever uh, in the committee. Uh, we readily acceded to her suggestion. Um, we rapidly discovered, of course, that he uh, was listed as one of the most influential people in the world today in Time magazine. Uh, his honours go on and on. When I began to read uh, his CV, I discovered, so we have one thing in common, that we're born in the same year, and we're exactly the same age, you and I. However, as I read further in your CV, this was an exercise in humility for me, because I discovered that your achievements went far beyond anything I could possibly imagine in myself. We have one of the most distinguished minds in the world speaking to us this evening, in Professor Ramachandran. That, I think, has been patently obvious to all of us. At the same time, he has recently commented that science should be fun and that we should recover and retain in our work uh, a sense of fun. And we've seen in our Gifford lectures this year how, in fact, things that are most profound and important in what it is to be human uh, can also be accessible to all of us lesser mortals and also fun. I'm sure that Lord Gifford would be absolutely thrilled at the lectures this year. These are exactly what he wished in his will these lectures should be. We have heard this week much, quite simply, of what it is to be human in a way that draws together the many disciplines that a university represents. It just remains for me, sir, to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all you've done for us and all you've said for us and for coming to be with us here in Glasgow. Thank you.